Hello again, fellow audiophiles. I am Wave Theory, and in this video, we are going to explore the question, which of these under $1,000 US dollar Hi-Fi Min DAC and headphone amp all-in-one units is right for you, if any? I have reviews for each of these five individual pieces. What are those individual pieces? Well, we have the EF400, the EF499, the EF500, the EF600, and the Serenade, which was made by Golden Wave here, all in this roundup video. And I have reviews of each of these individual pieces that I will put links to in the description down below, as well as a smaller roundup video where I looked at the 400, the 600, and the Serenade together that came out either very late in 2023 or early in 2024. This video is being filmed in late July 2024. There are rumblings of a Serenade Junior being introduced soon. There is a mostly Chinese language website uh, from Ally Express claiming to have it for at least pre-order. Since it is out now and I don't know what the story on that is, I'm going to go ahead and release this video with these five pieces because I think that is a fairly good roundup for the time. If the Serenade Junior comes out in the near future, I will try to get a review unit and report on that and where it fits in with these five when the time is appropriate. But see my reviews of each of these five pieces to get the relative disclaim, the relevant disclaimers and so forth, and then stick around with me after shameless self-promotion to do a deeper dive into how all of these relate to each other and the things that you should think about if you are thinking about buying one of them. All right, here we go. Hello. I'm one of the reasons that Wave Theory can't spend all of his money on audio gear. He wants you to know that your support is vital for keeping the channel running. So if you enjoy Wave Theory's bussin' review riz and no cap review style and want to encourage him to stay in the basement so I don't have to listen to his dad jokes as much, like the video and subscribe to the channel. You can also send him a donation on PayPal or sign up for the Patreon. Links are in the description. Now on to the review. Hi-Fi Men has clearly planted a flag that they are getting into the Source Gear game. And the evidence for that really is just right on this, in, on this table here. In about the past two-ish years or so, they have released five models that are some combination of DAX, headphone amplifiers, and streamers, all currently priced under a thousand US dollars. So they have gotten into the Source Gear game in a relatively big way. What they have not yet done is released many, or any at all that I know of, separate components, meaning a separate DAC, separate headphone amp, separate streamer, and so forth, under the Hi-Fi Men or Golden Wave branding, um, at this price anyway. With their acquisition of Golden Wave, who is actually the maker of the Serenade here, they do have a standalone headphone amp and preamp out known as the Prelude, which I also have a review for. It's a 2500 US dollar unit, and I'll put a link in uh, the description below for my review of that. But I get like so. Hi-Fi Mint has clearly staked the claim they are getting into this and they are doing it with DAC amps and some streamers. And I'm not sure what their rationale is for that particular approach other than convenience and that sort of thing for the end user. So these are attractively priced units and they also all perform pretty well. Some of them do have some flaws that we will discuss that, at least for me, haven't been deal breakers to uh, prevent me from recommending any of these, but they are things that you need to be aware of if you want to make an informed buying decision about any of these. So let's just kind of give it a quick rundown, and I'll give you my thoughts as to how all of these compare to each other. And then we'll also look at the broader market context in general and say, like, should you go for a DAC amp like this from Hi-Fi Man? Should you go for a DAC amp from some other manufacturer, or should you get a separate stack? Those are all interesting questions that I will provide some thoughts on, but not necessarily answer for you because I don't know what your individual situation is, and that's going to be a call that you make. Also, don't just take my word for it on these pieces or any piece that I ever review or talk about because I'm just one voice out there of many inform yourself as much as you can uh, to make your decision on any of these things. All right, 
So diving in. A quick reminder on the pricings here. We'll go from lowest to highest price. This is not order of release. The lowest price unit is the EF499. It is 300 US dollars. It uses a Philips R2R DAC implementation on it uh, in there as, um, as well. And so that's a little bit different than the other units, which all otherwise use uh, a version of Hi-Fi Men's Himalaya R2R DAC implementation, but that one is different in that way. But 300 US dollars for this one. It has a streamer on board as well for its price point. Okay, the next one, currently at 400 US dollars is the EF400. So that's easy to remember, EF400, 400 US dollars. This one was the first one of all of these to be released, if I am not mistaken, um, there. And um, it really excited me when it first came out. I thought it sounded, at the time, it sounded really wonderful. It still sounds pretty good, but two years on, its value proposition might be a little bit different. So we'll talk about that as the review progresses here, too. The EF500 is 460 US dollars, also has a streamer in it, like the uh, stand up model here next to it, that it was released right about the same time. The EF600 right here is $650, and the Serenade is just under $1,000 at 999 Okay. So those are the prices and I kind of hinted at some of the features. Let's go through the features again in the same order real quick just to give you an idea of what's in there. So the 499 is a DAC headphone amp and streamer in it. So it does have a land based streamer in there um, to go with it. It has a four pin XLR balanced headphone output and it's got a 6.35 millimeter single ended headphone output on it. I will say that all of these devices are designed and built to be balanced and they all perform noticeably better from their balanced connections. So when at all possible, use the balanced outputs on all of these because there is a noticeable performance gap between the balanced and single ended outputs to the level where like honestly i would just kind of ignore the single ended outputs on these honestly because the balanced is just so much better performing consider them balanced use them that way make sure they fit into your system that way okay the ef4 or the ef499 here also gives you two input options in a few different flavors you can connect either usb or lan to this or you can connect coaxial, RCA coaxial SPDIF uh, input on it. You can switch between those two options. If you plug a USB cable into this, it will automatically deactivate the LAN connection. And then the switch to uh, flip between using either the LAN or USB or the SPDIF is on the back. Okay, so that's something to keep in mind there if that is relevant to you. The EF400 has only USB input. Like most of these, not all of them, but like most of these, it gives you two flavors of USB input, either a full-size USB Type-B connection, I think it is, or a USB-C connector. That does not mean two USB inputs. You get one USB input. You just get to choose which connector type you want to use on that. This one has the most varied range of headphone outputs on it, but again, really only the balanced ones matter, and you get both 4-pin XLR balance and 4.4 millimeter Pentacon output on that. If you want to use single-ended, you do get both 6.35 millimeter and a 3.5 millimeter output on this one. Okay, the EF500 has the same connection options as the 499. So again, you get that choice between LAN, so it's got a streamer in it. You get that choice between LAN and USB, and then also the coaxial input. The selector switch is on the back. Same headphone output options on it as well. The EF600 is a little bit different. No streamer on this one, but it does have, um, it, you can use USB on it. It's got coaxial RCA uh, input on it for SPDIF. It also has both balanced and single-ended analog inputs. So if you have a turntable 
or some other external DAC that you really want to use for the amp in here for, you can connect to it that way. It also has a Bluetooth connection on it um, as well, but again, no streamer. It also has this very uniquely shaped volume knob on it here with this rectangular thing that you uh, grab onto there. And then XLR four pin balance headphone output and RCA single ended 6.35 millimeter headphone output on it as well. It also has the most unique shape of these. It is the most comfortable to use this one as a headphone stand. You can use the 499 and the 500 as a headphone stand too, if you wish, but the 600 has the best shape to be able to do that. All right, then finally here at 999 is we have the Serenade, which has the more classic form factor in it. It is a much more fully featured unit than any of the others because it has a streamer in it. It also has like all of the, the or, uh, it has both optical and coaxial SPDIF in it. So it's the only one of these five that provides an optical SPDIF input on it. Okay, it also can be used as a preamp where the analog outputs on the back of the other four are just line level DAC outputs. This one can function as a preamp as well from its analog outputs. Now it only has a single ended analog input. So if you wanna use a turntable on it, then you need to get one that has a single ended output on it to connect here. Okay, um, and then also this unit will do the, the widest range of decoding options. These units here, the other four units top out at 24 bit 192 kilohertz PCM decoding, whereas the Serenade will do PCM decoding up to 32 bit 768 kilohertz sampling rates, and it will also do DSD. So it's the friendliest, friendliest in terms of what kind of digital signal you can feed in here as well. Okay, so that's a quick rundown of like the features, the input, output, like that sort of thing, all that. So um, if I had to rank these in terms of feature friendliness and like the breadth of systems that you can use them in, right? The, uh, and system types you can use them in and all of that. So like their ergonomic flexibility, let's call it. I'd have to say that in D, that the best one would be the Serenade followed by the EF600, then the EF500 and 499 tie, and then the EF400 brings up the rear on that. Okay, and then again, that's just based on the number of input outputs that you can use and like just how you can use the device, all of that. Now, you could argue that the streaming functionality of the land-based streaming functionality of the 499 and the 500 do leapfrog it over the 600. I will would entertain that argument, though I think the Bluetooth and then like just the, the analog pass through and all of that on this one do open up some options that there's more options yet than these two can provide. But I do am sympathetic to the argument that having a streamer on board, arguably in 2024 in a world where so much of digital music is sourced digitally via streaming from things like Tidal and Cobuzz and Amazon Music and Apple Music and Spotify, et cetera. Okay, that the streaming capability on these is more useful than those uh, more, let's call them legacy things, particularly the analog inputs. But it's just, I mean, six of one way, half a dozen of the other, right? It's just gonna matter to you, the end user, as to what the best fit for your use case is there. All right. Let's talk like sonically then it's a quick rundown. To me, the 499 and the 600 are more, uh, excuse me, I mean the 500 and the 600, apologies. We're talking about the 500 and the 600 here are the most neutrally tuned of these. Like they are the ones that are like closest to, to true neutral in their perceived frequency response. The technical uh, proficiency, meaning like the detail retrieval and the resolution and the, the spatial holography and those sorts of things are a little bit better on the 600 than on the 500. Not a huge gap, but it is an audible gap in the favor of the, the 600. 
Okay, but these two are just, they are the most play it right down the middle in terms of frequency response, not really uh, elevating or emphasizing or de-emphasizing any major ranges in the frequency spectrum. I think the 600 is a little bit tonally smoother than the 500, so like cymbal hits and all that have just slightly better tonal balance on them than the 500. I mean, the, the 600 is the higher sonic performer of these two, not by a huge amount, but it is noticeable. The other three, the 400, the 499, and the Serenade, are still mostly in the range of neutral. The neutral is a range, uh, more or less, but they are on the warmer side of the neutral range. So I wouldn't just call them straight up warm, but they do trend more towards a warmth and a richness and a fullness to the sound in a way that the 500 and the 600 do not. Okay, so that's something to keep in mind there sonically as well. The Serenade is the best sounding unit on this table. Like it, not only does it have that warmth and like the tonal richness and fullness to it, but it also is the most uh, spatially holographic. It is the most resolving of these. It is the best detail retrieval, timbre, and those sorts of things of all of these here on the table, which shouldn't be surprising. It is the most expensive unit on this table by, you know, at least a couple hundred dollars. Okay, along the way, more like 300, 350, right? Did I say that one was 650? So about $350, okay, more for this one. So you do get more features and more sonic performance by jumping up to this one. The 400 is, again, it was the first one and I was really enamored with it when I first heard it. Cause again, it had that like neutral warm, very full rich tone to it, lots of holography and dynamism to the sound. Like it had some, a fair amount of impact and, uh, and uh, all that and physicality to the sound. That was fun and engaging, slight roll off at the top end too if you are trouble sensitive and all of that. Like not necessarily the most resolving, but it just had a magic to it that I really enjoyed. It reminded me a lot of Shit's original Bifrost 2, that kind of a sound uh, to it. In fact, I did a comp to that one, to that DAC, in the review video for the 400. The 499 takes after the sound of the 400 and the Serenade, but doesn't have quite the technical chops to it that the other two do. Like you can tell sonically it's the entry level unit into all five of these. That doesn't mean it sounds bad. It sounds pretty decent. It's just not up to the technical level of the rest of these. Um, but really I think the true value of the 499 is that it sounds okay, but it has that streaming capability. And for that price at $300 to sound pretty decent have a pretty capable amplifier in it and then like also have a pretty decent streaming implementation at $300 is actually a pretty good value okay so that's just quick thoughts sonically on these and like where they rank how they um, perform to e relative to each other and for the most part, as the, the price goes up, the sonic performance increases. So again, like working from best down, I think overall sonics, my ranking would be Serenade the best, followed by the EF600, followed by the 500, then the 400, then the 499. So again, basically just as the pricing goes, uh, so does the performance. One thing that I will add to that though, and this is particularly true about the EF600, is this, the 600 is very technically capable, but of all of these, it's the one that sounds like it's being the most technical in its sound compared to the rest of them. So even though the 500, for example, is still like mostly neutral, it still has like um, a, a romanticism and, a, and a, a musicality about it, just slightly more so than the 600. So the 600, while being very technically capable, just sounds like the kind of the most sterile and like the most like it's trying to be neutral and get out of the way of these five. That may or may not be a deal breaker for you, but it's just something that I picked up on um, on this um, there. But like from a technical level, it's definitely the second best of these uh, units here. Okay, in terms of driving headphones or IEMs, some things that we need to talk about on that. All of these have a fair amount of power. Interestingly enough though, the Serenade here on this table is the one that struggles with the most difficult loads. Like Hi-Fi Men's own HE6 series or the Susvara, 
The Serenade struggles with the most out of all of these on the table. These four units for their price can really drive those very difficult planar loads pretty well, where the Serenade um, struggles the most on those. The Serenade is the best sounding amp when you put um, headphones on these things that they are all comfortable driving, like HE1000SE, Aria series, and all that if you want to stay with Hi-Fi Men. But if you plug other things in them from like Odyssey, the LCDX, the MM500, or any kind of anything from Dan Clark, if you want to talk planars, or if you get into dynamic driver headphones like uh, the uh, Sennheiser HD 600 series, HD 800 series, whatever the case may be, okay, several full cows and all of that, the Serenade's gonna sound better than the rest of these by a fairly comfortable margin on those. Now, the EF 400 and the 600 in particular have a little bit higher output impedance from their headphone outputs. So low impedance dynamic drivers might, uh, depending on how low the impedance is, you might get some sonic uh, impacts from the damping factor being rather low. So things like my Focal Radiance and all that, which is a 32 ohm load, I believe, can sound pretty good from the 400 and the 600, but there are some times where the bass sounds a little bit boomy and sloppy because the damping factor stuff is getting messed with with the slightly higher output impedance of those. So for those two units in particular, I wouldn't recommend IEMs either because I think you'll really hear that come out with IEM usage. The 499 and the 500 are better in that regard, at least by ear. I don't know what the actual measurements of the, the uh, output impedance are is on these two. I know there are output impedance measurements for the 400 and 600 out there on the web, then they are a little on the high side, but I'm not sure what it is here. By ear, I did not notice nearly the amount of output impedance issues from these two as I did the 400 or the 600, but they might just be there just a little bit. So that's something to watch out for as the, the measurement crowd gets out there and shares that data. The Serenade shouldn't really be a problem though there might be just a little bit of noise in the, in the sonic background that might rule it out for super sensitive IEMs, but for most anything else that's not an extremely difficult drive, you should be fine on that one. So those are all things to keep in mind and really, one of the really impressive things about the 400, 499, 500, those three in particular anyway, is that for their pricing, they have really powerful and like very effective headphone amplifiers in them that can really drive some very difficult loads pretty well. So low impedance, uh, well, medium impedance, but low sensitivity planars, they handle pretty well. So we're talking HE6. If you wanna drive a Susvara on them, you can, okay? Um, you need to spend more to really drive the OG Susvara and do it justice, but HE6 series, they are fine for. High Zs from Sennheiser, ZMF, Biodynamic. If you can do the Biodynamics um, balanced, if you balance mod them or get something from the T1 series, that is high Z, like they drive those fine too. So that is really one of the nice advantages of those three in particular in terms of a value standpoint is just how robust and how much drive their headphone amplifiers have for the price. Okay. Other than those output impedance issues, what are the things that might hold you back from buying any of these? At least here in the United States, the lack of a fiber optic digital input on anything that's not the Serenade on this table here might be a limiting factor for some, particularly if you are you use headphones a lot when you watch movies or TV shows and all that. A lot of televisions out there or like Roku streaming boxes, that sort of thing, they have fiber optic Toslink digital audio outputs on them and you just can't plug that into any of these that aren't the Serenade okay, on this table. Now, I have been told that in Asia, and Hi-Fi Min is a Chinese company, that in Asia, the RCA SPDIF connection is a lot more popular than it is here. I don't know if that applies to televisions or not because I have a feeling that in China, they buy a lot of the same uh, television models that are available here in the United States where it's still mostly fiber optic connection. Um, but that's just something to keep in mind here, all that. Also, um, gaming PC motherboards, 
if they have an SPDIF output on them, usually is a, is a TUSLink optical as opposed to an RCA coax. And there's good reason for that, and that's because those gaming PCs can generate a lot of system noise, which can bleed over into the audio signal, particularly if you connect your computer to your DAC via an ele electron-based transmission system like SPDIF coaxial or USB, where you use actual electricity to transmit the signal between the PC and the DAC. Fiber optic uses light to be able to do that. And so there's a trade-off there, like the fiber optic is a much quieter means of connection. And so if you have a gaming PC and you use these for gaming, that's something to consider is that the optical connection isn't there and the USB connection might be on the noisy side. Now, the 499 and the 500 and the Serenade can get around that by at least allowing you to use streaming for your music, right? But then you still have to figure out a way to connect to the coax there if you want to do it for uh, gaming from a gaming PC or from a TV that only has uh, the optical output. So that's something to keep in mind, okay, on all of those. All right. All of them have high and low gain that you can use either an oversampling or a non-oversampling filter on as well. This is both a plus and a minus for each unit. As time has gone on, it seems like Hi-Fi Man has gotten better at their oversampling filtering because I thought the non-oversampling mode on the 400 and the 600 clearly better to me sonically than the oversampling mode. A richer, fuller sound, a more accurate sound, a quieter sound, a more dynamic sound, a slightly more resolving sound, okay, and more holographic to my ears on there. However, I think on the 499 and the 500, for most material, the oversampling filter sounded a little bit better. So that to me is Hi-Fi Man getting better at their oversampling filters as time has gone on since those are more recent. Last thing I want to talk about then is like build quality and the interfacing and all of that because the 400 in particular being the first one I think has like the most obvious like quality control issue in it and that is the potentiometer attached to the volume knob here feels really splashy to use. Like it just, this knob turns way too easily. And then there's also some noticeable channel imbalance here when the, the volume knob is very low. Okay, so that's something to keep in mind. The other thing about the 400 is it requires the most warm up time of any of these to sound right. So, and what I notice is that the left side is a little bit quieter than the right side. So there's a channel imbalance when it first starts up and then like two or three minutes into the music that finally uh, corrects itself. And then for whatever reason, and I don't know why this is, if you're playing through like a shuffled playlist in bit perfect mode, if you go from a high res file, like a 96 kilohertz file, and then it drops down to a 44.1 kilohertz file, the 44.1 kilohertz file is gonna have some popping and static in it. Not loud, not anything that's gonna damage your headphone or a, uh, an amp if you're using the analog output on this, like the line out on the back or anything. Nothing that's gonna damage that. It's just something that's there and a little bit annoying and a little bit weird, okay? And it does fade as the time playing goes on, but it's there initially. And so I don't know what that's about. I don't know if uh, newer units than this one, like if a, a fresh batch, a newer run has that issue or not, but that's something I noticed on this one. So the 400, while it sounds great, is the quirkiest of all of these um, in order, you know, in being able to use it. It's also, again, you only get one input, USB, that's it, okay? So something to keep in mind on that one. The 600 has a little bit better feel to the volume knob. It's got the unique shaped volume knob. I did not really notice the uh, channel imbalance issues with that one. And again, my biggest complaint about the, the EF600 really isn't in the use of it and all of that. Like the headphone amp stand on it seemed gimmicky at first, but it works pretty well. Like it's fairly well thought out. Um, it is tall though. 
like you see, it's not all that much shorter on its own, just standing right on the tabletop, than the 500 is stacked up on two other horizontally oriented units. Yeah, and you can see the, the height difference here. So you do need some vertical space to store this one on your desk. So if you like have a monitor on a stand or something like that, it's probably not gonna fit under there. You'll have to put it off to the side, okay? So that's something that uh, you should keep in mind there is like, you, can you accommodate the height of it? But again, my biggest complaint on it is just that it, it just, it sounds very technically capable, but it just kind of is a little bit dry and um, like, like it's just trying to be neutral and all of that in there, which isn't horrible. And it's not dry and lacking in a way that to me, like topping and THX amps tend to be. It's got more life and flavor than that, but it's just not like it's sibling models in terms of listening enjoyment in that way to these ears. Okay, so that's really my biggest complaint about that. It's like not really even an ergonomic one. It's a sonic complaint there. Okay, the, uh, the 499 and the 500, my biggest complaints about them are just the limited input options. Again, though, um, really, there's very little to complain about these two in terms of the performance that they offer and the feature set that they offer for the price. I mean, you can complain about the lack of inputs, but what you're getting for the price is really pretty compelling with both of those units there, um, in my opinion. And so there's not a whole lot to complain about, just given the price and like the likely use cases of all and all of that on these. Now for the, the Serenade, it is interesting to me that it's the least capable of driving the difficult headphones given its price on these, even though for headphones it's capable of driving well, it sounds easily the best of all of these. So that is a bit of a trade-off right there. Um, two things to comment on about it ergonomically though. Number one, it does get pretty warm. Like this is a very hot running unit. And so you might wanna be careful about stacking anything on top of it. Make sure that you have plenty of ventilation wherever it is you plan to use it. And then thing number two is given its price and its feature set, it seems like the kind of unit that could find its home as being the headphone and DAC option in a two channel system, but there's no remote control. So it has to be kept at, at, uh, within arm's reach in there. So I, I, for future iterations of this particular uh, unit here, I would like to see a remote control going forward. Because I think, again, given its complement of features and its performance, it's the one that seems most likely for someone to put it in a system where having a remote control could be of real ergonomic benefit. Okay, so those are my thoughts on all of that. Okay, so hopefully that's enough about all of these relative to each other. And you can see my reviews of each individual piece to do a deeper dive on any of them individually, just to get an idea if any of them are right for you. Let's talk about like where they stand in the market. Are you better off getting one of these or are you better off getting a separate stack? And on that front, I think Hi-Fi Man has done remarkably well. My philosophy, and I have said this in several videos, like when I review an all-in-one unit, and an all-in-one unit is just a unit that takes several different prime functionalities and puts them in one box, okay? So all of these are all-in-ones insofar as they all combine at least a DAC and a headphone amp in them. And then three of them also are uh, provide a streamer all in the same box, right? So that's what I mean by an all-in-one. And my philosophy has been, if I can assemble a separate stack for the same price that gives me the same or better level of performance and the same number of features and functionality, or at least a comparable amount of ergonomic functionality as the all-in-one, then the all-in-one is too expensive, the price needs to go down. Particularly as price increases, my thinking is that an all-in-one ha unit has to do more than provide convenience, right? Um, it's got to provide, also provide a compelling price-to-performance ratio. And so if I can match that or beat it and get the features, again, more and more true as price goes up with a separate stack, something is wrong with the pricing of the all-in-one. So with that context and that framing, 
I think Hi-Fi Man has done a at least a solid two really good job depending on the unit here um, in terms of price performance and features and convenience for the price here like with the 499 just as one example here i cannot name a separate stack where you get a DAC, an, a headphone app and a streamer for 300 us dollars that's going to noticeably outperform and out feature this unit you can come close with something like um, uh, uh, a shit, like Mahdi, maybe with you add the, um, the, the Magna Unity amp and like a Wien Mini streamer, something like that, you can come close to this. Um, and I comment more about that in my review of these two, okay? Like you can come close, but not quite get there, okay? In terms of some of the balance between price, performance, and features. And again, see my full review to like further unpack that. But that's one example. With the Serenade, I don't think I can name a, set, a standalone DAC headphone amp with one of those two having preamp functionality and then a streamer that's going to outperform this singular unit for a thousand US dollars. They do a pretty good job of it standing relatively alone in this category right there for its price. The 400, that one, particularly with its quirks, even though it, I really like the way it sounds, all of that, like I think you can put together a, a roughly $400 separate stack that's going to perform pretty close to it and not have a couple of the usage uh, drawbacks that it has. The 400, I, back in the summer of 2022, I thought was a really good uh, unit and had a place in the market here in mid-2024. Uh, I'm less confident about that one, frankly. Okay. All right, and that's just the way the market goes sometimes. It just gets caught sometimes by its own sibling units, okay? Um, this, this 500 and the 600, probably still true that um, it's getting difficult to match the performance that you get with a standalone DAC, pre or DAC headphone amp, and in this case, streamer. The 600 is probably getting easier to match. The 500 a little bit more challenging, okay? Not clear slam dunks there, but it's close enough that I could see the convenience argument winning over a separate stack for these two, okay? But again, see my reviews of each of these individual pieces to unpack a lot of that further. But hopefully this little roundup video has given you the information that you need to make a good decision as to which of these hi-fi men all-in-ones is right for you if any so i am wave theory thanks for watching please remember to like comment and subscribe check out my paypal and my patreon and generally be on the lookout for th things you can do to help support the channel and as always thanks again for watching and enjoy the music